being here, uh, to those in person, and for those who are watching us live streaming, um, I will ask our board secretary, where is she, um, to establish a, a quorum for the record. Oh, she's on this side today. <laughs> okay. It's been a long two days. I know. All right. Member Benitez. Present. President Craighead. Here. Member Lopez. Present. Uh, Member Miller. Here. Member Otto. Here. And student member Lopez. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you. And now we will have our student board representative, um, Frania, lead us in the pledge. Please stand. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. Thank you. For those of you present in the room, the board appreciates and supports community input at our meetings. During the meeting, there will be time for the public to comment on matters on the agenda and matters not on the agenda. For those who have not already submitted a request, we have provided forms here by where the secretary is sitting. And if you wish to speak during the meeting, please fill out a form now indicating your name and the agenda item you wish to address. The board has been meeting in closed session regarding matters listed on today's agenda. The board took action on the following items. On the closed, ses on the closed session agenda item from this morning's special meeting, the board voted 5-0 to approve a retirement agreement release with a permanent certificated teacher, resolving all claims between the parties and providing for consideration. From this afternoon's agenda, regarding item 3.1, confidential student matters, pursuant to California Education Code 35146, the board voted 5-0 to expel a student ID number 2747, pursuant to Education Code section 48915C3, with the recommendation that the student be considered for a suspended expulsion with an opportunity to attend another school within the district. This student will not be eligible to apply for readmission until after January 26, 2024. Regarding item 3.2, the board voted 5-0 to appoint Jeff Wood, and I see him here tonight, as Administrator for Outdoor Education, and Michelle Gallagher as Acting Vice Principal at Hughes Middle School. So um, first I'd like to congratulate Jeff Wood. This is a special appointment. This is our first outdoor school principal in quite a while. So um, that's really an honor. And I know you bring uh, a history as a High Hill camper, a High Hill teacher, and now you're going to be a High Hill principal, if we call it High Hill. I don't know. <laughs> OK. Um, we will now adopt the agenda. Um, are there any changes to the agenda? Nope. OK. I need a motion. I move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, sorry, <laughs> I was a little fast on that one. Um, any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that passes 5-0. And now we have um, a student representative from Sato, I believe, and that's Serena. And you're going to have to help me with your last name. I don't want to mispronounce it. But welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, good evening, LBSD Board of Education, faculty members, families, students, and the overall LBUSD community who may be watching. My name is Serena Kabuhat. I am a ninth grade ambassador at Sato Academy of Mathematics, Mathematics and Science, sorry, 
and I feel honored and grateful to be chosen as a young representative of this astonishing academy to speak with you all today about the uniqueness and development Sado has to offer. Now, I know that Gustavo Cortez Garcia, our ASB president, has already provided you all with the information and history of Sado. However, I would like to repeat that our school has had the official ceremony of receiving the Gold Pathway Certification thanks to Mrs. Saeed, our Linked Learning Coordinator, and that our school is within the top 0.5% of schools in the nation thanks to the wonderful staff and Sado Dragons. To give a shout out to the Sado staff that helps keep our school in a positive and pristine condition, we have our principal, Ms. Coleman, and our counselor, office staff, college and career center advisor, social worker, campus security, and our cheerful custodial staff. Their everyday outgoing and buoyant behavior makes the students at Sato want to stay longer and motivates them to complete their work. I also want to thank all of the Sato teachers who work very hard to push us to our goals. Elaborating more on the work we do at Sato, we do a lot of work-based learning and guided independence. Now, what this means is, what student, is that students have the freedom to figure out what they want to create slash accomplish with the assistance of a teacher to get them started or finished. This process also helps our students accomplish our four SOTO outcomes. Accomplished industry professional, collaborative communicator, creative innovator, and problem solver. For example, every year, we have an integrated project. This project puts our students in a real world scenario where they research, create, and present a product that can solve the scenario. And they will later present this product to industry professionals. It's kind of like Shark Tank. <laughs> As freshmen, we create a product that helps people survive an extreme environment, such as the jungles, the high seas, etc. Some students have created water filters, flare devices, compact multifunctional equipment, and more. As a sophomore next year, I would create a roller coaster design to study physics and the effect that they have on the heart. Now, aside from the general projects at Sato, we, ex we explore mock crime scenes, genetic disorders, and diseases in general, such as leukemia. Leukemia is a type of blood cancer that impacts the white blood cells and can cause a lowered immune system. During this time, our class observed these cells through a microscope and compared them to healthy cells to determine their abnormalities. I believe this is a perfect real world scenario for me because I want to become a pediatric oncologist. I would love to pursue this career because I was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia at the age of 10. And in the future, I would like to help other children, like myself, that are facing this awful disease. We are also participating in the Make Able Project. Now, the purpose of this project is to help make the lives of children with a disability easier. This is teaching me how to properly interact with children and help them complete their goals. We also do a ninth grade in inquiry project. This project requires us to select a topic that we are interested in and an output product to express our goal. For my project, I chose to raise awareness about Asian hate through a poem and how Asian American history should be added to our school's curriculum to reduce the hate. <coughs> However, enough about schoolwork. I entered, oh, sorry. I entered Sada with a few accomplishments, such as most inspiring student, valedictorian, one of the only two mathematicians of the year, and athletes of the year. Now, I am very proud of these, these accomplishments and the experience that I bring with me to be successful here both academically and physically. These are truly shaping my new accomplishments of being an ambassador and being able to participate in the eighth grade recruitment on behalf of Sato. I also have joined the Sato basketball intramural team as one of the only as one of only three girls. We made it to the semifinals this year, and it has been a thrilling experience. Now, adding on, Sato has had many fun social events, including our Silk Sonic themed 
fall, fall formal, masquerade, winter formal, Halloween night market, fall carnival, basketball games, and Sado Night Live, our first talent show since before COVID-19. Sado Night Live is in Sato Night Live included a variety of talents ranging from a yo-yo performance to singing. <laughs> yeah, it was really interesting, by the way. <laughs> like, it's, don't get me wrong. It was like a whole bunch of music and everything. Anyways, <laughs> uh, to singing, dancing, and playing instruments. Now, a couple of specific dances included K-pop and traditional Filipino dance called tinikling, a dance that involves sticks and clapping. I was proud not to just see the Asian and Filipino representation as a Filipino American myself, but also be a part of the performance because I am part of the Filipino club Barcada, and this translates to a group of friends. I'm thankful that the Barcada club president, wait no, I'm thankful for the Barcada club president because she taught our members how to properly perform to Nickling. Overall, I am grateful to all of the ASB members and the ASB advisor for coming up with all of these fun events, and I really hope they create more in the upcoming years. As you have heard, Sado has added many new events and activities over the past few months because of everyone's creativity and will to push their ideas forward. With our Dragon's resilience and thoughtfulness, the possibilities for our future are endless. Thank you so much, LBUSD board members, for giving me the time and opportunity to speak with you about our outstanding community. And go Dragons! <laughs> uh, Serena, we are very happy to have you. I, I'm happy I, to be I'm, here. I'm still trying to um, <laughs> process all that you all that you've shared with us. Um, do you have someone in the audience you'd like to recognize? Um, um, parents, somebody from the school that's here to support you? Honestly, I know my parents would have loved to be here, but mm -hmm. unfortunately their work keeps them uh, out late. But <coughs> I'm very grateful to all of them because they've created me, um, the person that I am today, um, who's kind, thoughtful, and caring. So I'm very grateful to all of, to both of them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that <laughs> reminder. Um, well, this this is being live streamed, but they can always watch it later, and they can always see how well received um, your message has been. You have been. Uh, you talked about resilience. Um, I, you have, you have academic accomplishments, you have athletic accomplishments, you are a blessing to your family, you are a cancer survivor. I have a cancer survivor, my son, so I can tell you from a parent's point of view, they are filled with pride that you are standing here today, that you are so healthy, and so accomplished, I, I, I can't even imagine, it's just so wonderful. But thank you for sharing that with us because um, we, we can share in, uh, just in the excitement of seeing what's possible. Um, so colleagues, is there anything else? Uh, you are a tough yeah. act to follow. I don't, I don't, know, if, I don't yeah. know if we can get to the business of tonight. Cause <laughs> here, here is why we're all here. You are the reason, even though your parents are not physically here, they're with us uh, tonight, and we're here as proxies uh, for your yes. family and your parents. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I feel Thank so overwhelmed with all of these compliments. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Otto? Yeah, I, I uh, was very touched by uh, your words and uh, your experiences, and I, I was at Sato for three hours last week looking into the Project Lead the Way programs that they have, and I was so impressed. I met with two students uh, for 30, 40 minutes, and then we went and talked to instructors and saw the things that were going on, and uh, I tried to explain it to people uh, here uh, at the board, and lo and behold, last night when I got home on Channel One, which is the uh, spectrum, uh, they, they had a whole program on, um, uh, pardon? 
dr drone soccer. And uh, I, I said, I, I, I challenged us to get that uh, <laughs> because it's already put together. And uh, I'm so impressed with, uh, with what Principal Coleman is doing. And uh, uh, you're, it's a great school and you're a great student. Thank you. I feel honored to represent Sato. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Miller. Well, I don't think I need to reiterate how much of a superstar you are <laughs> because it has been very clear by what you've shared today. Um, I'm just so impressed with you. I, I want you to know that uh, one of the things that you spoke to is something that I share with young people all the time, and I'll share it again for those that um, are probably exhausted with me hearing about or me talking about this, is that uh, we've all been through something. Something, you know? Um, it could be something as large as a medical diagnosis, uh, something as small as losing a loved one, or something as big as losing a loved one, um, but all things considered, you start to recognize how, you start to gain an additional recognition of how important this life is and how helping others is just as important. And with that said, uh, you talked about what you wanted to be after you graduate from high school. Yes. And so um, often you hear about people, especially I'm going to say us young people <laughs> wanting to leave and make tons of money. And I want you to leave and have a great living. But uh, don't just make a dollar, make a difference. And uh, That's my main continue goal. to do so. Mm -hmm. All right? Thank you. Of course. You. Thank you. And we're going to invite you up here so we can do a photo. Okay. So I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. yes. <laughs> to, OK. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just so anxious to do a photo, apparently. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, you're so accomplished at such a young age. <laughs> to me, um, listening to what you have been through and what you have accomplished um, until now, um, you're an inspiration for me. And um, I feel like I can learn so much from you from your younger age, even though I'm a senior. Um, I have a lot of things to um, yet to learn. And you yourself, you're so educated. You're so destined for an amazing life in the future. And I can't wait to see that. Um, I know, and I'm calling it right here, right now. You're going to be an, an incredibly successful person. And make us all of us proud. And I know your parents are proud as well. And um, let them know that you're an amazing person. I mean, we all, everyone has complimented you because <laughs> that's what you deserve. You're an amazing person. And um, keep going. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In your life, oh, in your career. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you are so impressive, um, Serena. And like student uh, board member Lopez said, I can't wait, we can't wait to see what you're going to do beyond high school because I'm sure you're going to help um, to change the world. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you. I hope to pursue all of these uh, statements that you're saying. My apologies. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll have her come up here, take a quick pause, and.
going to try and get to business. Um, what I usually say is thank you for being with us, but we understand there's homework and other things, so um, we understand if, uh, if she needs to go. Okay, so uh, now is the time for public comment. We want to allow members of the public to make comments without interruption in a polite, appropriate manner, of course. Um, and we, let's see, we do have people wishing to make comment for items listed on the agenda. Um, again, I'll just remind you, it's three minutes. We have a lot of people who want to speak, so uh, let's be mindful of that. First, we will start with Crystal Davis. Do I just start? Okay. Um, hello, Board of Education members and executive staff. My name is Crystal Davis, and I'm a science teacher at the California Academy of Mathematics and Science. I'm a Project Kindle Fellow and a Senior Fellow for Earthwatch, as well as a Honeywell Educator. I have been a consultant for the National Math and Science Initiative. I have recently been appointed as one of only two high school teachers nationally who are on the Curriculum Development Committee for AP Environmental Science for College Board. I have also been featured as a teacher in interviews on CNN, the LA Times, and the Daily Breeze. This is my first time speaking at a school board meeting because, as you can tell, I have been extremely busy but school safety is of the utmost importance. I am here today to ask you to please use me and my fellow teachers as a resource. As teachers, we know what works for our students because we interact with them every single day, yet we are not consulted on the professional development we are mandated to attend that is supposed to benefit the students. Many of us teachers are at a breaking point. Many of my colleagues are openly talking about quitting the profession altogether. We need help and we need to feel valued. As teachers in LBUSD, we have three to four hours of mandatory meetings a week, when you, which when you aggregate the total time equates to four professional development days per year. These meetings are often pointless, new learning is not gained, and they are a complete waste of time as a proposed learning is not applicable to our teaching environment. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. During one of my more recent professional development meetings, we had an activity we were supposed to model in our classes where we were told to have students physically throw pieces of paper at us teachers to get to know each other better. As a professional educator, it is utterly demeaning and abusive to have anyone throw things at me, even if it's paper. Given the climate of violence that is taking place in schools across the nation and even in our own district, is that appropriate behavior to model? I think not. And how is this sort of activity really supposed any of us develop professionally? You should be talking with and working with the amazing teachers we already have on campus so we can help each other to bring out the best in students rather than waste our time with demeaning activities that don't add anything to the classroom or to the self-esteem of the teachers who work tirelessly to educate our children. We can do much better, but our current professional development needs a lot of work. Instead of demanding that our teachers attend four additional days of professional development, these are four additional days that most teachers, to be absolutely blunt, do not have the time or energy for. We should focus on fixing and strengthening our professional development curriculum so that professional development is not only time efficient, but effective. Beyond the ineffective nature of the current professional development curriculum, we teachers are stretched too thin already. As a teacher at CAMS, I have lab classes with an average of 36 students in each class. That is a lot of students who have needs both inside the classroom and outside the classroom that I try my absolute best to teach and mentor. So far I've written on my own time nearly 100 letters of recommendation and I'll need to write dozens more before the year is up. In addition to my normal instruction I also have to run labs before the students do them. This easily takes at least 10 hours for one lab and I'm teaching three different labs simultaneously. That's 30 hours of prepping per week beyond grading student work after school. Why would you want to dump more days of work on top of our already busy schedules? Please do not mandate that teachers attend an additional mandatory four days of PD when our current time is not being wisely used please do not put that additional burden on us when we are already mentally taxed and many of us are at a breaking point. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, next we have Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie. Madam President, members of the board and executive staff. I am Stephanie Balvado, counselor at Wilson High School in the medicine and biotechnology pathway. High school years are full of growth, promise, excitement, frustration, disappointment, and hope. It is this time when students begin to discover what their future holds for them and school counselors play a vital role in students reaching their dreams. With my current caseload of approximately 650 students, and this number has been as high as 800, I want to bring to your attention the challenges we counselors face in our daily duties as we try to meet the needs of our students. 
My student caseload includes students with 25504 plans, 47 IEPs, and, 107, and 137 seniors requiring letters of recommendation on top of over the 500 students in lower grades who need academic and emotional and career development support. Besides our own caseloads, many of the counselors are in charge of activities on campus. For instance, I am responsible for the Wilson Scholarship Committee, which requires months of planning and above 40 hours of additional work each year. Our duties involve supervising students before school, during lunch, and after school, which drastically limits our ability to meet with students. We attend multitude of meetings, including all staff meetings, required professional development, pathway meetings, triad meetings, and meetings with the triad to plan for our pathway meetings, district counseling meetings and department meetings, and our own counseling department meetings, and now listening sessions, as well as coordinate PSAT, SAT, SBAC, LPAC, and AP testing. It is not uncommon for us to receive complaints from parents and students who feel we are unavailable to address their needs. This year, Without any explanation, our work hours changed without consideration and how, and how this would impact our students. Our hours are from 8.30 to 5 p.m., even though most students leave campus by 4 p.m. And additionally, students and parents are allowed on campus at 8.15, but have to wait until we arrive at 8.30 a.m. This prevents us from having IEPs, SSTs, 405s, and parent conferences before school. As counselors on the front lines, we believe that such decisions should involve our input as we know firsthand how these decisions re negatively affect our ability to support our students. We are asking, or we encounter students with suicide ideation, disorders, and medical conditions, including mental health issues. We are asking that the district take the bold step to develop a comprehensive school counseling program and support counselors who are the first responders to our students and parents in need. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, next, we have Shandi, Shandi McGee. Good evening, uh, Madam President, members of the board, and executive staff. As a KA counselor, I am responsible for the safety and well-being of approximately 811, 811 students that span across 10 grade levels, with students between the ages of 4 and 15. It breaks my heart when I have to decide between supporting my middle school student that is suffering from suicidal ideation and my elementary student that is screaming to the top of his lungs in the elementary hallway and needs help processing his emotions. Both of them are equally important, but because I am one person that is responsible for 10 grade levels, I have to prioritize who needs me the most. This is unfair to me and to my students. I wake up in the middle of the night worried that I missed a sign, that I missed a student that may have needed my help because I was unavailable due to time spent in three hour long IEP meetings, 504s, gate testing, LPAC, iReady, SBAC testing, or the many other duties that take me away from providing direct support to my 10 grade levels. According to the American School Counselor Association and the California Department of Education, studies have shown that the overall consensus is that schools where counselors are providing a comprehensive school counseling program, there are increased test scores, adequate social emotional support for students, and effective career development support. This leads to overall resu results being lower chronic absenteeism rates, fewer suspensions, higher graduation rates, and higher college entrance rates. This information was previously provided to all members of the board and executive staff by one of our organizing committee members. In addition, these studies were done prior to the pandemic, where we now see an increase of social anxiety and additional mental health issues in students as young as five years old. Have you ever done a suicide assessment on a second grader? I have, and it's heartbreaking. I'm pleading with you to send a life raft to our counselors that are drowning in the work that we love. Please lower our ratios according to the ASCA national standards so that we can see more LBUSD students succeed. 
Thank you for allowing me to speak today, and I am proud to be LBUSD. Thank you. Next, we have Heather Morrison. Hi there. My name is Heather Morrison, and I'm speaking today about school safety. I teach sixth through eighth graders in a special day class for students with mild to moderate disabilities in Elson Academy, a middle school in central Long Beach. Teaching is a second career for me, and I've been teaching now for about two and a half years. I have done many different things in my life. I actually know some of you from various different things I've done in the past. And I have lived in many different, all over the world, basically. And I can honestly say that I am shocked at the environment we find ourselves in at the moment. To say nothing of the difficulties of teaching in a special day class with, with students with a wi wide range of abilities and a variety of complex needs of their own, I would like to speak today about the current state of our middle school students and teachers in general. We are not okay. At my school, there are near daily fights, which students gleefully film and post on social media. Staff have been injured. Students have destroyed restrooms and damaged other parts of the campus. We have just changed our schedule to three lunches, one for each grade level to try and calm things down. It seemed better for a few days, but the fights have ramped up again. Students do not seem to understand the typical boundaries of being in a school community. They certainly have trauma from the last few years. They have missed out on a chunk of school socialization that would have been typical without the pandemic. What it feels like is that some students are coming out of the pandemic having forgotten how to be decent humans, both to each other and to the adults on campus. Add to these things the fact that, they, that we are, understandably, given history, trying to pull away from things like suspensions and instead work to come up with alternatives to punishing them, and what we are left with is unmanageable chaos. It feels unsafe. It is very unsettling. It is stressing out the students who are coming to school to learn. It is taking a toll on teachers. I personally know several teachers who have taken stress leaves or stepped away from teaching entirely. I do not come to you with a solution today, but I just wanted to let you know that we really are not okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Annette. Annette. Annette Quintero. No. Well, we we're going to continue because she's not actually in the room. Um, oh, but she is here. Oh, okay. Well, welcome. Hi, good afternoon, sorry about that. I ended up signing up to speak for um, safety, but I'm appreciative that you can fit me in for public comment. Um, so my name's Annette, I'm a RSP teacher at Poly, um, and I'm here to talk about why I love teaching, and yeah. So I love teaching, I'm a great teacher. Uh, they say to teach is to inspire, and it's what I try to do every single day. Um, inspiration comes from experienced professional instincts, creating relationships with students, not mandate professional development. Earlier this year, I received a beautiful letter of appreciation from one of our school's stellar football players. In this letter, Tristan stated that I made the class fun, exciting, and entertaining. He also stated that he learned to view the uh, situations from multiple perspectives as a positive thing, something that perhaps he hadn't done before. Tristan's letter also stated that if he found a class assignment confusing that he could count on me to relate it to his life and what was going on so that he could better understand the assignment. Moments of connection like this cannot be taught in professional development. There's no hyperlink resource that exists to create spont spontaneous connection. We are all great teachers who know how to access curriculum and pacing guides available to us. We use our money uh, to supply our classrooms with pencils, erasers, and papers because the district did not provide us with funding this year for those supplies. We strive to meet state standards despite obscene amounts of testing imposed upon us. Some things we do need are to be appropriately compensated for our labor, smaller class sizes, money for classroom supplies, peer collaboration time, to feel safe and secure in our schools, to support English language learners, and planning, grading, and IEP writing time. 
We also need to increase the number of counselors, psychologists, social workers, and special education teachers so that we may provide appropriate support to all our learners. What we do not need is additional professional excuse me, additional professional development days that continuously reduce students to data points and talk about students as cogs in a machine and make students feel bad about themselves. The fact of the matter is that we do not need these four professional development days to be better teachers. We need fair and equitable funding that meets the daily needs of students and their teachers. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> And I see that we have uh, quite a number of people who uh, wish to speak on items not listed on the agenda. So uh, we only have 30 minutes for um, items not listed on the agenda. Um, so just know ahead of time, either you can maybe shorten what you're gonna say or just know that we won't get to everybody. Um, yes, and uh, comments on uh, any items not listed for discussion today uh, must be about issues that are within the jurisdiction of the board. And please note that due to California law, the board cannot enter into a discussion on any items not listed on the agenda. Board members or staff may ask clarifying questions or provide clarification regarding public comments, uh, but such discussion is limited. And again, each uh, speaker we'll have three minutes. And first we have Glenda Culbertson. Before I start, I'd like to say that Serena Kabuha was my student at Tincher and inspiration is an understatement. She is definitely a student to watch in her teen and adulthood years. Oh, good evening, President Craighead, board members, and executive staff. My name is Glenda Culbertson, and I am the teacher librarian at Tincher, Henry, and Carver, speaking to restore teacher librarians in our elementary schools. Our focus every day is what is best for the child in the chair. Children need a teacher librarian because we support students to become responsible and proactive citizens every time they enter a library. We impact students to say, the library is the best part of school, and I want to be a librarian when I grow up. Librarians are essential because we prepare students for rigor expected in middle and high schools. My middle schoolers who came from a media assistant know less about research and inquiry than the students I taught at Tinger. My own children have a media assistant in elementary school and did not learn the resources and topics from their media assistant that I teach. We also apply our training from the California School Library Association and District PD, including equity training and SEL instruction that media assistants don't receive. Replacing us with a media assistant means more children, especially at Promise and Special Ed, will experience a learning loss. Librarians are professionals who bring the school community together. Our programs network with community resources to enrich our students. These are not activities in the job description of a media assistant. Tincher's Literacy Night was last week that it was a program that I co-organized with a committee and we had a successful event that families asked us to have again next year. Do you recall visiting a school event organized by a media assistant? Libraries go, librarians go beyond your expectations because we love our students and we want the best for our schools. The district's priorities are shifting towards optics that don't support student success. 82 new overhead positions with a facilitator in every school will not have direct contact with students on a daily basis. It looks good on paper, but it is overhead work. Librarians, however, support students and teachers because we co-plan, co-teach, and co-assess student work. We provide SEL instruction, time for small group intervention, and valuable planning time for teachers. More library time to our Title I schools is equitable and commendable. But through the looking glass, overall cutting teacher librarians for overhead jobs devoted to paperwork and optics do not support the mission and vision for our students. What is best for the child in the chair? Give them a teacher librarian who teaches critical thinking and research and inquiry. Give them a librarian who brings their school community together to celebrate reading. Let us provide strategic intervention for at promise students in all schools. Invest in teacher librarians because we, along with classroom teachers, know what is best for that child in the chair. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 
Next we have Joanne. Joanne, thank you. My name is Joanne Levy. I am a special education teacher at Jordan High School. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Please say no to the Wellbeing Center at Jordan High School. This is allowing Planned Parenthood on our campus. Planned Parenthood promotes cross-sex hormones for teens. They say on their website, and I quote, patients do not need to participate in therapy or provide information from a mental health provider to receive care. Why would Planned Parenthood not care about mental health therapy before giving cross-sex hormones? Well, because these teens may discover that they actually accept their bodies. These teens may become mentally well. And that's a problem for Planned Parenthood and the drug companies that profit by peddling cross-sex hormones. There are thousands of detransitioners who have altered their bodies through drugs and surgeries and are extremely depressed and suicidal over decisions they made as teenagers. There are women who detransitioned, who permanently have deep voices and facial hair from testosterone. Many even went further to get double mastectomies. These young people wish so much that they could have been given mental health therapy so that they didn't make such a serious mistake that led to permanent physical changes. And what about younger kids who question their gender? Well, Planned Parenthood has a plan for them, too. It's called puberty blockers. Children as young as eight years old can receive these drugs to stop puberty. Does Planned Parenthood know or even care that the FDA now warns that puberty blockers can cause brain swelling and vision loss? Can an eight-year-old really make this kind of decision? These are the values of Planned Parenthood. Do our Jordan parents share these values? Did you ever ask them? I'm sure you didn't. Otherwise, Planned Parenthood would not be on our campus. The Wellbeing Center is very adamant that parents do not to need to be informed about the counseling their center provides. Well, of course they have this position. Now, there is no sane voice to protect these kids. Once you remove the power of the parent, any predator can harm a child. The fact is that children and teens are too young to make decisions about permanent changes to their bodies. Again, why is Planned Parenthood not promoting, promoting mental health therapy before giving cross-sex hormones? If they really cared about our youth, they would make drugs the last treatment possible. But no, Planned Parenthood promotes puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones as treatment number one. Go to their website. See for yourself. This is not caring for children. This is fattening the pocketbooks of Planned Parenthood and the pharmaceutical industry. Please say no to the Wellbeing Center. Stop the abuse of our children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Teresa Wilvet. Good evening, board members. My name is Teresa Wolvet, and I'd like to speak under items not listed on the agenda. I'm the teacher librarian at Longfellow Elementary. As a teacher librarian, I teach lessons that are based on Common Core Model School Library Standards, focusing mainly on digital citizenship and research using California state-provided databases. I also collaborate with teachers to enhance classroom learning. I would like to speak tonight to the word equity. The district has provided LBUSD educators with a great deal of training on equity. Because of this extensive training, we all know that equity is different from equality. To summarize the famous equity picture, if the goal is for everyone to look over the fence, equity is when everyone gets the same size, oh, sorry. Equality is when everyone gets the same size ladder. Equity is when each individual gets a ladder that will actually help them reach the goal of looking over the fence. To me, equity in our school libraries means that every student has access to a qualified teacher librarian each week. The new elementary library staffing chart states that this plan is in alignment with LBUSD's excellent and equity policy. However, this chart leaves approximately 23 schools in our district without a teacher librarian. It uses enrollment numbers and Title I percentages to determine library coverage for each school site. 
According to this chart, if you work at a school site that has less than 450 students, 74% of your students can qualify for free or reduced lunch, but, it will, but will not qualify for a teacher librarian position at your school library. Longfellow currently follows, or sorry, falls in the category of 750 plus students with 40 to 60% Title I. Under the new staffing model, Longfellow will have no teacher librarian support and instead will receive one full media assistant. It is the only school in our district that lands in this place on the chart. I find myself asking why other schools with 40 to 74% Title I will receive at least 50% teacher librarian support, but not Longfellow. As the only school in this category, it feels like our students are carved out to receive different educational opportunities. To reiterate, approximately 430 Longfellow students with the lowest socioeconomic status will not receive quality library instruction with a, quality, with a qualified teacher librarian under this plan. However, other school sites with the same number of students who have the same lowest socioeconomic status will receive um, funding for a 50% teacher librarian from the district. This chart is not based on equity, and I do not even believe that it is based on equality. This is a budget issue that once again leaves our most vulnerable students without the tools they need to succeed in school. Because, these obvious, because of these obvious inequities in the current elementary staffing chart. I'm Thank sorry, you. Teresa. <laughs> Next, we have Elise. Elise Bryant. Good evening. My name is Elise Bryant, and I'm the mom of two kids at Longfellow Elementary. Last week, Title I elementary schools were informed of a new policy that rebalanced library coverage. This new formula used percentages of students receiving free and reduced lunch to determine if schools would be designated a credentialed and experienced teacher librarian or instead a media assistant. This decision was justified under the shield of equity, and I'd like to talk about how it's not actually equitable and does a disservice to LBUSD's most vulnerable students. I'm going to focus on the case of Longfellow where I'm a parent and a member of our school site council. Our school site council had already voted to supplement our 50% teacher librarian using our school's Title I funds. This change now takes our teacher librarian away completely and replaces her with a media assistant. And in fact, Longfellow is the only school in the specific category of the new formula, which designates that we receive a 100% media assistant instead of a teacher librarian. A media assistant has never served a school of this size independently before. I believe that this strategy of using percentages doesn't do an accurate job of comparing schools and dividing resources because our school has almost 1,000 students. So if you're really looking at the numbers, over 400 of our students receive free or reduced lunch. And we also have 140 black students at Longfellow, which is the biggest black population at any elementary school in the district. These underserved populations at Longfellow are bigger than entire schools that are in some cases being allocated a teacher librarian when Longfellow is being denied this necessary resource which leads us, to, leads us to question, why does 400 kids at Longfellow mean something different than 400 kids at a school with less students? With this formula that has been created, it seems that the district is supposing that the experience of kids who receive free or reduced lunch at Longfellow is somehow elevated by being around wealthier kids, and that's why they are being designated a staff member without a teaching credential. This is, of course, very troubling and doesn't align with the values I believe LBUSD to have. If we are truly reaching for equity here, this change in policy doesn't seem to achieve that. True equity would be providing all students at Title I schools, the students who need the most support, with teacher librarians who have the education and expertise to serve them well. Outside, outside of being a mother to two Longfellow students, I'm also an NAACP Image Award nominated author of children's books published by HarperCollins. So over the past few years, I've watched in disbelief and horror as school boards across the country ban books written by my colleagues, especially books written by black authors. We need our teacher librarians more than ever. And while this action taken by LBUSD is less blatant, I believe that removing teacher librarians from Title I schools is also going to actively harm an entire generation of readers. Our teacher librarians design curriculum and teach our kids informational and digital literacy, so there's no way around it. Replacing them with a less qualified staff member is providing our students with less. The 976 students at Longfellow deserve more than just library coverage. It is my hope that Brian Moskovitz and the OCIPD reconsider this extremely harmful policy and keep teacher librarians in all of our Title I schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Samantha. 
If I could have your attention, please. Good evening. My name is Samantha Lurie. I'm a proud first-generation college graduate and National Board Certified Teacher. I've worked for Long Beach Unified for 20, uh, sorry, 24 years. I've taught at Stanford, Lakewood High, Long Beach City College, and I'm currently teaching at Wilson High. My two children went through Long Beach Unified, and as a parent, I've seen it through their eyes. They are both strong advocates for social justice and fairness. And in my 24 years with this school district, I have never, ever attended any protests or publicly expressed my concerns and frustrations with this district, but I now feel compelled to speak. Fannie Lou Hammer, the civil rights leader, once said, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. And right now, this is how I and the teachers and counselors of this school district feel. I am here to speak about equity. I am currently enrolled in the San Diego State doctoral program. I'm not sure why, but administrators get to leave and not get docked. And yet my African-American counselor friend who is in my class gets docked from his personal pay. Is it because he's in the union? I don't know. But the administrators don't get docked and he does. This brings me to the four days of training. You want us to agree to training we know nothing about. Let me discuss the previous SEL training. We went willingly to a couple years back. It was a waste of time and money. I don't need to develop a rapport with my students. I have it. Your instructors haven't taught the students of today. My students are navigating a loss of instruction during COVID and teaching correct pronouns to teachers and adults who are confused. I'm still trying to navigate teaching of students who have lost COVID instruction a student asked me yesterday while i'm teaching the civil rights unit miss lurie why do other white people not like us black students and i'm able to have that conversation with them because i have a relationship with them i'm wearing this today because one of my students who is in foster care has a cheer competition and she doesn't have anybody else to give it to miss lurie will you wear this so with her permission tonight i'm wearing it I don't need your SEL training. I love my students and I'm here for my students. <laughs> I don't need t-shirt Tuesdays or emails that say you care about us, okay? If you appreciate us, then please show us the financial rewards you gave yourself or raises like the districts surrounding us are doing. Long Beach used to be a leader. I quite frankly have had enough of this back and forth with the union and the school district. This is not what our school district is about, okay? I don't know what's motivating you. Is it greed, is it power? I just want to know what's going on in my school district. I'm here for the children. Can we be here I'm for the sorry, children? I'm sorry, but your time is up. <clears throat> Thank you. Next we have Lily. Next we have Lily. Thank you. I'm sorry, Lily, no worries. but you may start. I love your kids. I love your kids. Can we just stop? Yep. Okay. And she's out. Good evening. My name is Lily Esquivel, and I'm a kindergarten teacher at Burbank Elementary School. This is my 12th year with the district and sixth in kindergarten. Each year in kindergarten, I have faced challenges with full class sizes, very little classroom support, and increased testing demands. Teaching kindergarten online proved to be challenging, but this year, by far, has pushed me to my limits. Like all kindergarten teachers, I had to begin the year with furniture I did not want and that does not work for my size of my room. Teachers are forced to keep the furniture, furniture even when there is not enough space for 30 students to sit and do academic work. Then there is the all-day schedule. I never thought I would cry on the first day of school until it happened this year. While the district barrels ahead with the full day schedule, it fails to listen to teachers like myself who say it's just too much. If you add more hours to a student's day, then by the same means, more support should be added for teachers. Each of the three kindred classes at my school have 29 to 30 students, but only has one college aide to share for 45 minutes to an hour per day. If that aide calls out sick, which is bound to happen, we are left on our own with a full class to make up assignments, complete crafts, 
and test students, which sometimes requires one-to-one, -one, such as FIRSA does. I encourage each of you to visit a school like mine to stay and observe the amount of work a kindergarten teacher does. It is truly remarkable, but unlikely unsus un not sustainable. How can it be? I know for me, I stay late and I do prep work on weekends since I don't have classroom parent support as other schools may have. Trying to do small group instruction and testing in my class of 29 is extremely difficult with the noise level and the attention that five to six year olds require. It's not appropriate to have so many kids in one classroom with such little support and expect a teacher to feel confident that he or she is giving the adequate attention that all students require and deserve. I know for myself, I have reached my limit. I can no longer teach in kindergarten under these conditions. While I feel all grade levels have their challenges, kindergarten is always a unique grade. It is not required by law to enroll in, but the testing demands are nonetheless there. The support, however, is not. If the district truly wants, wants what is best for kindergarten, it needs to reduce class sizes or provide additional support for schools who are at full capacity. While the district states it has a 25 to one average, it fails to consider schools like mine who consistently have full classes. How is this equitable? If you really want to close the achievement gap, please invest in lowering class sizes and giving students and teachers the support they need and deserve to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Grace. Grace. Good evening. My name is Grace Castro and I'm a teacher at Robinson. I've been a teacher in the district for 27 years. I am here today to address the district's proposed four days. Uh, we have learned that the exit tickets that teachers are asked to complete at the end of a PD session are being utilized as a nexus that teachers are enjoying the PD sessions. I want to address a few issues with this. First, the Google Forms that are used as exit tickets are linked to our district emails, which provide no anonymity. Consequently, teachers are afraid or hesitant to provide negative feedback. Second, the questions at, on the exit tickets are phrased in a manner that solicits positive responses, such as, what was your takeaway? That's positive. What will you try in your classroom? That's positive. Third, the only opportunity given on some, not all, exit tickets is when there is an open-ended question at the end asking for feedback. Even then, teachers want to be respectful and hold back on giving a scathing review. If we knew that these exit tickets were going to be utilized against us as a pre to add four more days to our calendar for PB PD, I assure you that our feedback would have been very different. So I want to deliver my responses to the exit tickets in person. Teachers were never asked to provide input as to what type of training we would like or need. In turn, it's difficult to buy into something that we have no input on, and more importantly, does not serve our needs. Teachers are receiving the same canned training, and there is no differentiation. I sat through a reading training where we had to watch videos and phonological uh, and phonemic awareness, and then write down the definition of terms such as rhyming, syllables, and blending. This seemed more like a Reading 101 college course. We're not expected to teach to a one-size-fits-all classroom, so why are we given PD in this format? Mm -hmm. Since this is a data-driven di uh, district, where is the correlation data showing that the PD is making a difference with our students? Last, when does the district expect us to digest and experience, explore, much less implement what was shared in the PD since more keeps getting added to our day, but nothing ever gets taken away. In closing, the district PD has not been excellent, nor has it been equitable, so why would we want four more days of this? Thank you. Next we have Jerry. Jerry. Madam President, uh, Jerry Morrison, teacher at uh, McBride High School, uh, resident of uh, your uh, board district as well, by the way, and a proud parent of uh, children who came through uh, Long Beach schools uh, and are also doing well. Uh, I want to speak about um, contract negotiations. Uh, as I'm sure everyone in this room uh, knows, um, uh, while the negotiations are not dead, um, they're, they're on life support at the moment, and I'm hoping um, that the board, uh, as your uh, in your position as leadership, 
uh, of these negotiations can, uh, can breathe a better life back into them. There are two things that we all know uh, are a problem. One is the, the pay offer from the districts. Now, uh, we've been in these negotiations th since the fall, and everybody knows that this year was a kind of an unusual year where the district got lots of money from the state for, for a whole number of reasons. Everyone knows that the cost of living increase from the state was well over 12%. By some kind of magic, that translates into an 8% offer from the district. We haven't been told exactly how that figure was arrived at, how 12 comes down to 8, it would be helpful. We know it might not have been um, 12 uh, at, at the end of it, uh, but we think there's a difference between what we think uh, the cost of living comes out to and what you do. That's the first thing. Teachers feel like they're having to fight for stuff that they're entitled to. They have to fight and shout and scream um, to a district that begrudges them the raise that the state of California has financed and given you to give to us. So that's the first thing. And then, to add insult to injury, that raise, that inadequate raise, is being held hostage to accepting something that is completely unrelated and came out of nowhere, four days of uh, professional development. You don't get to say what it is, that's what we're told. You, the district will decide. Uh, teachers have no input into uh, how the day would be structured. What you've heard tonight is what people think of the professional development, right? And it's a take it or leave it offer. The inadequate pay raise is also on condition that you accept these four days of professional uh, developments that nobody wants. Despite that, we've tried to negotiate. We've had counter offers. We've moved from we don't want any to okay, we'll do one. Then we went to, okay, we'll do one and maybe some half days that we could tie in with minimum days. That was unacceptable. Now we've said, okay, let's do two. We're compromising. We want to negotiate. And from your side, it's take it or leave it. This is it. Here's the pay offer. Here's the professional development days. Take it or leave it. People are upset. That kind of resentment festers. It influences how people think of the districts. It influences how people and do their jobs. It's not a good situation. Please. Thank you. Next we have um, Marisol. Marisol. Mm -hmm. Good evening, my name is Marisol Ibanez. After 20 years as a classroom teacher for our district, I transitioned out of the classroom into counseling two years ago. COVID changed everything. Looking in the tiny black boxes on Zoom forced me to rethink how I could best serve students. The one thing that was clear to me was that the existing mental health challenges students already face were exacerbated in a way we could never imagined. I spent the pandemic researching how to support our students and greater school communities to recover from mass trauma. I knew the only way for me to provide that support, I would have to leave the classroom. The first surprise was to accept my promotion, I was actually receiving a pay cut. I don't understand why counselors are on a different pay scale from other PPS credential holding colleagues. I'm obligated to work an additional three weeks a year for nearly the same salary and my caseload of students under my care multiplied by four compared to when I was a high school teacher. Today, I'm an elementary school counselor at a school with a population of over 850 students. To be effective, I have to know my, com my school community. Relationships are the building block of healing trauma, developing trust, and successfully understanding the needs of the incredibly diverse populations I serve. Relationship building takes time, the one thing I do not have as a school counselor. To compensate, I choose to work of um, and hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of unpaid hours to adjust for the time I spend during my duty hours counseling and supporting my students and their families. There, this wouldn't be necessary if LBUSD adopted the ASCA recommended caseload of 250 to one. Dr current district ratios jeopardize the ability of counselors to implement trauma-informed and restorative counseling practices that foster equity and support the effective implementation of MTSS. Comprehensive school counseling programs support the social emotional health, academic and career goals of all students and are by design in alignment with the district's efforts to develop tiered systems of support for all students. 
Currently, the district only funds half of the counselor's position at my site, which means the district funds our students at a 1,700 to 1 ratio. It is demeaning and a grave injustice to our students and their families that schools have to use Title I funds to support basic needs for students such as counseling. As counselors, we are skilled mental health professionals that are specifically trained to support our students, and yet so many of us are forced to execute duties that are direct conflict with our roles. Content standards have set clear expectations for teachers for decades. ASCA standards for school counselors provide parallel and concrete expectations of our role on our campuses. Aligning and protecting counselors' duties with ASCA standards is a concrete first step toward the development of comprehensive school counseling programs. If the district is serious about its commitment to equity for all students and the establishment of MTSS, please utilize and empower your counselors to do what we are trained to do and allow us to do it effectively by lowering our ratios. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next we have Ellen. And, and um, after, this will be our last speaker because that will put us at 30 minutes. Good evening, my name is Ellen Johnson and I'm the computer science teacher at California Academy of Mathematics and Science. I'm here today in response to the proposed four additional days to spend on professional development for which I wholeheartedly oppose. The district already gets so, much, so many more hours from me than they pay for. Besides what I do in the classroom, here's a short list of what I give in the effort to support my students. I am the grade level team lead for which I have one extra meeting per month. I'm on the school site council for my fourth year in a row, which is a few extra hours per year. I am the class of 2024 advisor, which meets Thursday after school for one and a half hours. I am the advisor for six other clubs that meet regularly, for which I give my time for meetings, fundraisers, moving nights on campus, etc. I also teach the yearbook class. I get paid for my in-class time, but I have spent over 35 hours of my own time making sure that we have a quality book and all deadlines are met. I have attended four professional development days this year and three pullout days for which I have lost my conference period, so those 10.5 hours I have put in unpaid on my own time. We also have a field trip this year that we had to be on campus at 6.15 a.m. and return to campus at 5.30 p.m. The last student read left around six. I was available for just about 12 hours, but this was counted as a regular work day. I also provide tutoring after school and I'm regularly available to my students until 5.30 p.m. On occasion, I am at school until 10, depending on the activity or finishing my own work before I go home, since I gave my prep time to help others out. Did I mention that I provide tech support to my fellow teachers? I could go on, but this already covers the, over four, the four professional development days. That being said, the quality of the professional development offered in the past was a waste of our time. I want, if you want to provide professional development, first you need to assess who needs it. Most of the time, I feel like the speakers are preaching to the choir with little opportunity to dive into our own curriculum and get meaningful feedback on our process. This is bad teaching at best. Many times it feels like they are speaking to us in a way that checks off a box and not really interested in our development at all. If they want us to explore new implementations, then they will need to give the time and resources to make those changes. You cannot change your curriculum by listening to someone talk to you for four days, but who will not provide the curricular resources to draw from or try to rework and get feedback on your lessons. It's an exercise in futility and makes the time constraint even more debilitating. I decided to be a teacher because I think that providing a nurturing, safe place for my students to find their own path and meet the real world on their terms is the most important job that I can do. I give my whole heart to my students. I would like the district to respect the time that I already give and not to ask for more. Time is the one thing you don't get more of. There is only so much that you can pack in before you break. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Can I motion to extend common time another 10 minutes? Yeah. Do we have a second for that motion? I'll support that. I'm good with that. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? We will extend um, time to hear three more speakers. So next we have Christina De La Garza.
Evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Christina De La Garza. I'm a teacher librarian at Hart Elementary School and I'm also a very proud parent of a student at Bixby Elementary. I'm here to comment on recent changes to the elementary school site allocations for teacher librarians. As you may now be aware, the new allocation formula favors large schools with high numbers of students from low-income families. While I am very happy that this formula secures a full-time teacher librarian at Bret Hart, I am also saddened and concerned that other campuses will be losing the amount of time that their campus will be served by a teacher librarian. Some schools will even be losing access to a teacher librarian altogether, and many elementary libraries will be staffed by classified media assistants. Why do we need teacher librarians? We are highly trained personnel. The position requires an additional graduate program in addition to initial single or subject, multi-subject matter teaching credentials. I have two master's degrees and I know many of my colleagues do as well. The job goes far beyond circulating books and sharing stories with students. We teach students how to research, cite sources, identify misinformation, and act safely and responsibly online. We promote SEL by giving students a safe space where they can learn, create, and spend time together. We have spent countless hours curating collections in which our students can see themselves, and we proudly defend the students' right to read books that are banned elsewhere in this country. School libraries are more than book rooms. They are community spaces where beautiful and important things happen. Teacher librarians are an important part of the village of educators in LBUSD. Rather than reallocating us, the district should be ensuring that all students in elementary school have access to a high quality library program. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Mimi. Mimi. Hi, I'm Mimi Kao. I'm a Los Cerritos fifth grade teacher and currently also on the board of the Teachers Association of Long Beach. I'd like to address the current bargaining updates that are being published by the district and talk about some of the implications of the words that are being used. So may I remind you on February 24th, the district announced that it had increased its salary offer from 8% on schedule and 2% off to 8% on schedule and 3% off. They have not budged from that since they released that, even though the update that came out today said that it was a recent announcement. Taub has gone above and beyond to negotiate and bargain in good faith by considering an offer that was not sunshined at the time that it was requested to be so that the public can review what the terms and offers would be. We have not, as an association, resisted talking about this proposed four days of additional time. I think it's pretty clear that in the room, teachers are not in favor of additional time being asked from us by the district with no specific plan for what is going to be given to us in training with no input and consultation from teachers of what we want or how it's going to be delivered. You have not considered the community impact of additional days of supervision that would be required if these days are scheduled for the middle of the school year. And I'd also like to uh, address the fact that repeatedly in your negotiation updates, you are fronting this additional duty requirement as a salary increase. So I'd like to say that yes, if you're asking us to work more, you should be paying us more. But don't just selectively mention that we're going to be paid more for working more and call it a salary increase. It is commensurate with the work that we are doing and you know that we are already working more than 2.2% a year. Lastly, I'd like to address the additional TOSA positions that are being created at multiple school sites. If the district is going to say in today's announcement of bargaining that you are considering declining enrollment, I question the advisability of creating additional teacher positions outside of the classroom with uh, vague funding and no guarantee that those teachers would have a position anywhere after they are done with the special assignment. We value teachers. We know that these positions are not being asked for by our school sites. And we ask that you negotiate in good faith. Board, please listen to our most recent counterproposal. 
Thank you. And um, lastly, we have Jennifer. Yes, Jennifer. And this is our last speaker. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Larson. Uh, I'm a kindergarten teacher at Twain Elementary School. I've been teaching for this district for over 25 years, and I am a proud alumni of Poly High School. Go Jackrabbits. I shouldn't even have to be here tonight, though. I should be home with my family, talking to my daughter, who's a senior before she graduates and goes to college, or maybe checking in with my eighth grader to see if there was another fight at her middle school today. Yet I am here to tell my story. This senior staff wants to extend the school year by four more days. That's expensive for all involved, and is that the best use of our money? Will it solve the issue of student behavior? This year, I've been hit twice by students. I've had a student elope off campus. I've had to evacuate my room with my class because a student was being violent and throwing things. I've had blocks thrown at me. Other students have been tackled in the classroom and on the playground, and you get the idea. My first grade colleagues have also been hit. They've been headbutted in the stomach by a student while the student also furiously tries to slap them. And one student pushed another student and gave them a concussion. All of these severe behaviors did not result in a suspension. So let me ask you this, will the four extra days solve that problem? Where are the people to assess these kids and get them the help they need? Why don't you put the money there? This is not just my story. It's everybody's story. Because what's happening at my school is not in isolation. It's happening all over this district. This district does not need to impose four more days of professional development on the teachers. If the district can't come in and establish consistent discipline policies so our classrooms have an environment where all students can focus on learning in a safe space, it does not matter what you do for professional development. If you lose the learning environment, you've lost the students. Thank you, everyone, for uh, providing public comment. We have some very impassioned teachers, teacher librarians. Um, personally, it's good to see librarians back in the room. This was a pre-COVID thing. We always had our librarians in the room, so it's nice to see you. Um, but we will move on uh, with the agenda. And next, we have recognitions and acknowledgments. The ACT program is the program for our students with disabilities aged 18 to 22 years old. After students leave high school, they come to us and we kind of shift away from the academic and we really hone in on what's functional and what's going to make them as independent as possible. Some students come to us with a lot of skills and a lot of potential to live independently. And then some students come to us and their goal is really just to be able to navigate the community, be able to help out at their home and be a contributing member of their family if they stay at home. It's really about finding each student, meeting them where they're at, and then trying to get them to grow as much as they can from there. Every week we come to Prisk and we help out with all of the recesses and the nuntis. So we are basically what they call rec and Rec, rec aid and training. It's just a great opportunity and, and it really shows that Long Beach Unified as a district is willing to help propel all their students and find them something that they can do later in life that they love. Uh, thank you team for that bright spot. <clears throat> that was uh, very nice. Um, now we move to consent calendar A, um, and that's item number 13. This consent calendar groups the approval of routine agenda items into one action for efficiency and to allow the board to focus our meetings more on student outcomes and other key issues of the district. Uh, is there any discussion regarding items on consent calendar A? Uh, Mr. Miller. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to personally thank uh, the Austin Eckler Foundation on item 
<clears throat> 13.6 for his donation or their donation towards uh, the poly gymnasium or athletic department in particular. Uh, let's just say that's one heck of a donation to say the least. Yes, um, any further discussion on the consent calendar A? Okay, then we will have uh, our board secretary take a roll call vote. Madam President, you need a motion and a second. <laughs> that would be helpful. Okay. So I move the adoption of uh, consent calendar A. Consent calendar A. Second. Uh, any further discussion? Now okay. I will have our board secretary take a roll call vote. Thank you. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. And student member Lopez preferential vote? Aye. Okay, that passes 5-0. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, next we have consent calendar B and uh, Mr. Miller, I yes. believe you have a comment. Yes, I will recuse myself from consent calendar V as I have a potential conflict of interest under, under government code section 1090 and under 87100. SoCal Gas provides services to the Long Beach Unified School District and has in the last 12 months provided a donation to the nonprofit corporation Ranchos Los Amigos Foundation, which I am the CEO. Uh, any further discussion on consent calendar B? And we need a motion. We need a motion, yes. Move approval. Do we have a second? Second. And Madam Secretary, you take the vote. Member Benitez? Aye. Uh, President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Uh, member Otto? Aye. And student member Lopez, preferential vote? Aye. Okay, that passes 4 0. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, we have. Um, a new business item 15.1, approval of resolution 031523-A, bond resolution, approving documents that will allow the next issuance of Measure K and Measure E bonds and the first issuance of Measure Q bonds. Um, I'm gonna hand this over to Ms. Takahashi. Sure, we are seeking to sell bonds. Um, the third uh, issuance for Measure E, the seventh issuance for Measure K, and the first issuance for Measure Q for an aggregate total of $480 million that will go to market for. And this is to provide the, um, the funding and support for all of the facilities projects um, that Mr. Miranda presented this, this morning. Great. Uh, do we have a motion? So, second. <laughs> Any discussion? I will I'll, take roll call. I'm, oh, you're a roll gonna, call vote. Oh, that's right? a roll call vote. For re for resolutions, it's best to do a roll call vote. Okay. okay. So, Madam Secretary, Member Benitez, aye. President Craighead, aye. Member Lopez, aye. Member Miller, aye. Uh, member Otto? Aye. And student member Lopez preferential vote? Aye. And that passes 5-0. Thank you. Um, next we have 15.2, approval of resolution 031523-B, proposals for the sale of district property at 999 Atlantic Avenue, Long Beach, California, 9. 0813. So we need a motion. So moved. Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> Madam Chair, can we have Mr. Miranda speak to uh, that item as well as the item 15.3? It's it just so happens he's at the podium. <laughs> so yes, Mr. Miranda, will you speak to items 15.3, 15.2, and 15.3? We're on the same page. Good evening. So I'll gladly speak to both resolutions that are before us this evening. As you're well aware, the surplus and disposition process for surplus properties for school district can take some time, right? So we've been at this for the better part of three, four, if not five years. I've been before the board at least half a dozen times providing updates with respect to our surplus and, a surplus and asset disposition process. 
these two particular resolutions really bring that process to a close for us on these two particular properties. So we've done everything we've had to do with respect to the way the law lays out asset disposition processes for school districts. Um, started off by the formation of an asset advisory committee, uh, which was comprised of a number of different stakeholders from the community and the school district at large. They put forth a recommendation via a report that came to the board that was approved. Uh, that then uh, took us down the path of a public offering where the off properties were first offers, offered to a number of public entities uh, within the district boundary and within close proximity to the district boundary. We had no takers, uh, even though we made a good-hearted, concerted effort um, to seek some interest there as well, right? So we had no takers at that point in time. Next for us um, was a, a waiver with respect to the process we would undertake to score proposals for these two particular parcels. So uh, kudos to the board for really factoring in different um, weighted criteria uh, with respect to the proposals we were to receive. So the board had us not only look at price as a factor, but also look at community good components, um, minority owned businesses, woman owned, owned businesses, things of that sort as well, local businesses, financial strength. These are all categories that our raters looked at with respect to these particular proposals. Uh, so in fact, we did receive four proposals from different entities for 999 Atlantic, three proposals for 4310 Long Beach Boulevard. Uh, we ranked those proposals and what we have before us via the resolution is the top contenders that we'd like to move forward with in terms of the final sale agreements. Uh, each of these two proposers uh, really hit high marks with respect to each of those categories I just mentioned. Uh, so for 999 Atlantic, uh, that's Dr. Fussell, Dr. Iwajoku. Uh, they own a number of businesses within the Long Beach community, medical practices. They're proposing a mixed use development over on 999 Atlantic, uh, which would house a number of their medical practices consolidated on one property, but also include an affordable housing component on the top section of this particular redevelopment. Um, really attractive project on many fronts. For 4310 Long Beach Boulevard, that's 2H property. They had the top ranking proposal based on a number of those factors as well. All cash offer, quick to close. Uh, they've redeveloped a number of these particular buildings uh, for medical use and other uses within the Long Beach community as well. And they're proposing medical use for this particular redevelopment. Uh, the property's well suited for that type, of, that type of use. It's zoned for that type of use already. Uh, and then in closing, um, we would look at quick closes on these particular properties. So for 999 Atlantic, we're looking at coming to a final close on the entirety of the process and turning over the building uh, no later than end of May. And then for 4310 Long Beach Boulevard, no later than end of April. Uh, so rather quick processes going forward. Thank you for that. Sure. <clears throat> it, it has been a long road. And I know that's uh, required a lot of a lot of work and a lot of effort. So thank you. Um, let's see. Did we was that discussion on the motion? Is that a, and that's a resolution. So Madam Secretary, For, thank can you. we have further discussion? We can um, have further discussion. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so uh, Mr. Miranda and the team, I just want to thank you for the time and effort. Uh, it seems like ages ago that we passed a resolution. Um, that included uh, some of the things you referenced in the criteria, uh, right? I, I, I know that this was a new uh, approach that we took. Um, I think um, at the time you heard from uh, our board that this was something that we wanted to explore. Um, so I just want to affirm um, the commitment that we have for any future surplus consideration of properties um, that we um, don't just go out and look for the you know, biggest bid, uh, so to speak, but that we're intentional in what we mean by public benefits or community benefits. Happy to hear that we have a mixed use uh, proposal. So thank you for these two. I think there's, they serve as good learning uh, for us. I, I, I know that we're gonna fine tune moving forward, but I just wanna re reiterate the importance that if we're in a position to uh, sell properties that we continue um, leading with the uh, public benefits, community benefits, uh, pieces of the property. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, any further discussion? I just have a question. So the, the funds from the sale, uh, where are they going to? Sure. So the funds from the sale go back into the building program. So really to benefit students, staff members, um, across the multiple projects we embark on via our capital improvement projects. 
Uh, any further discussion? I think we're ready for the vote. Okay. Member Benitez. Point, point of clarification. Oh. Is this for both or is this for one? No, this is for the first one. This is for 15.2. <clears throat> So the Atlantic property. Okay. Member Switch. Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Uh, Member Miller? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. And student member Lopez preferential vote? Aye. So that passes 5-0. Thank you. Um, next we have 15.3, approval of resolution 031523-C. Proposals for the sale of district property at 4310 Long Beach Boulevard, Long Beach 90807. So we need a, a motion. Yep. Uh, before we start, President Craig, out of abundance of caution, I will recuse myself from voting on this item due to a potential conflict of interest. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have a motion? I move to approve. Second. Uh, any discussion? All right, Madam Secretary, we're Thank ready you. for that vote. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Abstain. Um, member Otto? Aye. And student member Lopez preferential vote? Aye. So that passes three uh, with one abstention, right? Two. Two abstentions, yeah. sorry, three, two. Okay. Now can we, we uh, I'm sorry, Letisa, can we reread the uh, vote? Right, so it passes 3 2 with uh, Benitez, Craighead, and Otto are A, yes, and then Miller and uh, Member Lopez are no's. They no. abstained. No, they're, they're, they're abstentions, they're not, right? Abstentions. Not no's. Not they're no's. Abstentions. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. Thank abstentions. you. Yeah. Okay, now we have 15.4, approval of resolution 031523-D, designating chief technology officer as senior management of the classified service and rescinding designation of senior management for the classification of executive director, information and technology systems. Do we have a motion? Move for approval. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay. Uh, that's a resolution, so we'll have. Thank you. Our secretary take the vote. Member Benitez? Aye. President Craighead? Aye. Member Lopez? Aye. Member Miller? Aye. Member Otto? Aye. And student member Lopez preferential vote? Aye. So that passes 5 0. Thank you. And now we have 15.5, approval of board meeting date change from April 19th, 2023 to April 17th, 2023. And I will note that the change means it goes from a Wednesday to a Monday. I move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, that passes 5 0. Two people in one honor are not here yet. We told them they'd be here. Oh. We said, can we take a five minute break or something? Well, we, we still have reported board members. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yes, next we have reported board members and reports and announcements. So, um, Frania, let's start with you. All right, um, past, this past Tuesday, LVCC came to visit uh, Jordan High School and they invited me for a circle. They, um, they just kidnapped me out of class to um, ho um, hold a discussion with um, around 16 other students, um, students who are um, very involved with our school activities. And they asked for input on potential programs um, and also additions and also opinions um, that we could add onto the new program that Mr. Um, Rex Richardson, our mayor, um, approved to uh, add little to no cost uh, um, programs that could potentially lead to 
uh, a career path. These will be dual enrollment uh, courses offered to students um, around the district. And I, uh, I push forward for um, financial classes, uh, business classes, and home economics classes due to um, my personal interest uh, wanting to be um, involved into finance and business in the future and also because I've heard a lot of my fellow students be very interested in uh, economics and uh, like stocks and financial management. Um, also home economics because a lot of students they they have different um, life stories. They don't always have uh, parents to take care of them and I think essential life skills are necessary for students especially coming into um, college life, and it'll be a good uh, way to uh, um, help them into their futures. Thank you. Thank you, Frania. Um, Mr. Miller? All right, I got excited. Some of my people came through the door. <laughs> no, but uh, on a um, more serious note, uh, the past couple of days have been a lot. Uh, when I say a lot, it was a lot of information. Uh, it was clear that it was a lot of work. Uh, it was composed of what I would consider a lot of hope for the future. Uh, and I could not have been uh, more pleased with all of the great just production that I, I'm going to see for the future as a daddy who has a young person who is going to be part of our 2035 vision um, I am obviously highly invested in the success of our district and uh, I could not be more impressed with some of the work that has been done thus far and I just wanted to give a big round of applause to all of the admin team and all of the community members and uh, folks from all components of the Long Beach Unified School District that helped us get to this point. So if you guys don't mind, just give them a big round of applause. Um, uh, today, we ended our board workshop centered around board governance. And so as uh, we talked about the next steps, and all honesty, and this is me actually talking more to my colleagues in the community, uh, we were challenged with a, a, a bit of work by Dr. Benitez here. And as we talked through uh, some of the work that needed to be put in towards our visioning, which needed to be put in towards providing guard guardrails and structure, uh, we did not have a plan. Uh, and as I'm big on having macro vision, you gotta execute. And so I wanted to challenge us as a board on putting together a committee that would structure a plan so that we could meet our goal of having firm guardrails in place for our superintendent to work with going into the next school year. That's my report. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Benitez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just going to build on Mr. Miller's and Ms. Lopez's comments. Uh, we, had, we had a lot uh, right in the last uh, two days. I want to thank and echo your sentiments, Mr. Miller, um, our staff uh, and teams uh, for all the effort that they made to give us a whole lot of information in a um, condensed uh, form. And so uh, I also want to thank um, the students and a parent that uh, spent some time with us and um, shared their own personal uh, testimonies you know bottom line for us is we can talk about the things that we're doing but it's important to hear from uh, the folks that are impacted and benefiting uh, from uh, all the work that we're doing so um, I encourage our community members that didn't get a chance to see the last day and a half two days live we started with um, early learning and extended learning opportunities yesterday ended the day yesterday with the Long Beach Promise presentation, and then covered a whole lot of facilities this morning, um, budget development. Um, so for folks that are curious and interested in um, how we're developing our budget, 
and the engagement that goes along with that. Um, I think it's important to revisit uh, the processes and the timelines that we use. And then, as you said, Mr. Miller ended with governance today. I want to lift up two things. And, and, and I'll start with um, the governance piece, Mr. Miller. So I think it's important to keep reminding ourselves as a board and as a system that um, the way that we know that our system is effective, uh, I'm glad teachers and counselors and teacher librarians highlighted this today, is um, if and when our student outcomes improve. And we have some goals right now, uh, particularly for our um, black students and some of our vulnerable populations. Um, I think an additional part of that is the role that we as a board play in representing the values and the vision of our communities around student success. Um, and we can only do that and measure if we're successful or not effectively by developing board goals and guardrails and um, implementing systems of accountability uh, for those. M much of that work um, is being done by our superintendent and executive team, but I think uh, part of that requires for us to step up our game, Mr. Uh, Miller, so I accept the challenge. Uh, I'd love to follow up with you know, setting up what process we're going to use uh, to start, um, not start, to continue the conversation uh, around uh, board, yeah, and, 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 and finish in the spirit of finalizing that piece of it, but the, uh, the broader sort of trajectory of, of a shared, of a student-focused outcomes governance uh, continues on uh, beyond the lives of us uh, here. So um, partly finished, uh, Dr. Baker. So uh, challenge accepted. Uh, Mr. Miller, I, I, I challenged us to um, try to get as much of that done in the spring so that coming in the fall, we could have things like a monitoring calendar in place and systems in place around continuous improvement and holding ourselves uh, accountable for that continuous improvement. So it's actually a challenge for our communities that have already participated in many uh, ways, either through our LCAP process, our budget engagement process, our a strategic plan, uh, but also to those communities that for whatever reason have not been able to engage or have chosen not to engage, uh, that we also want to do right by those communities um, to make sure that our goals are in alignment with our community's vision uh, and values. So I wanted to lift that piece up. I also wanted to lift up um, a piece of where we ended yesterday. I'm going to share some of the comments that I made uh, to my colleagues and, and, and with Dr. Baker directly around our Long Beach Promise. Um, much of what our teachers and counselors and teacher librarians and nurses and staff and principals do um, may not may go unnoticed on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, but the bottom line for us is uh, upholding a promise that we're making to students around being college and career ready and on being successful in whatever endeavors they choose to embark on um, through their educational uh, lives here. Uh, Franya, I'm looking at you, uh, but beyond. Um, and that requires us doing some serious work around some of the equity gaps that we have and doubling down on making sure that all students are college and career ready. Uh, but there's a life after LBUSD, even though we'd love to keep you here with us uh, for a longer time, we know there's a life beyond um, your uh, experiences here at WSD, and that requires revisiting, Dr. Baker, uh, the commitment between our school system, our Long Beach City uh, College system, and our Cal State uh, Long Beach system around the intent of a promise to ensure um, college for every single student uh, in our district. So I think it's important that if we made a promise in th 2008 that had certain in, in, uh, assurances uh, to making sure that every single student that graduates from LBUSD is able to pursue their dreams uh, and go to college, um, that in revisiting how we um, are fulfilling uh, that promise, that we seriously look at um, who's benefiting from that promise what we're promising to students, and what the outcomes of that promise is. And so I am looking forward to 
uh, conversations between our systems leaders, including Dr. Baker, Dr. Munoz, and Dr. Connolly. Uh, but I am also encouraging um, beyond our systems leaders for us to engage in what that promise would look like. Uh, what we expect of students has to coincide and be in alignment with what our educational partners are, are going to support students with. This is not solely the work of LBUSD uh, because let's say that we get 100% A through G completion rate of our graduates. Will they be able to go to college? Right, whether that's the financial resources that are needed for that, um, but also policies that reflect that if we're doubling down on making sure that students are 100% A through G completers, that they're gonna have options, all right? And what better than to have an option than to go to our local uh, institutions? Um, so if CSULB prides itself in being the flagship of the CSULB, of the CSU system, uh, well then let's double down on our partnership with LBCC and, and CSULB. And it's not an either or. This isn't about LBCC or CSULB. It's about, make, about making sure that we are consistent uh, across our uh, partner institutions and the more recent partners, our port and our city of Long Beach. I wanna lift that up because I know there's gonna be upcoming conversations and spaces, uh, but I also want to make sure that our community students uh, and partners are vigilant that we've received the information, we've noted uh, what's happening, and uh, I think we need to figure out um, how we do right by LBUSD students and this promise of ensuring that each and every one of you, uh, Franya, has an opportunity to go to college. Thank you. Um, I know you're expecting somebody, so I'm gonna move past you just but don't let me forget you completely miss Lopez it's okay to move past me <laughs> well I'd like to thank uh, the principal and the music teacher at McKinley Elementary School for inviting me to their drum circle assembly I thoroughly enjoy participating um, with the students playing the drums and visiting the campus um, thank you both for the warm welcome I also like to um, acknowledge the students at uh, the Polly's Musical Play Ch or Musical Chicago, who were so wonderful on stage, super impressive. Um, the students who performed, who danced, the uh, those in uh, that had to do with the the crew, the production, they were great. Luke Porter, Casey Friend, Zoe Hayes. And Tom Woods, you did a phenomenal job with, the, uh, with your performance on stage. And of course, this is not possible without the support that they receive from their wonderful teachers, the administration there on campus. And uh, so a big shout out to Ms. Vaughn, Ms. Negrete, Ms. McGee, and Mr. Doko. You were outstanding. Thank you for supporting the arts program at Long Beach Poly. And uh, last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge the Jordan basketball team who fought hard in the playoffs and uh, brought so much pride to Jordan High School and to nor the north side of Long Beach. Uh, thank you players for representing our district with great character on the court and a huge thank you of course to the coaches, the faculty, the students uh, who supported the parents, who supported the players throughout the season. And that's it, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Otto is trying to organize <laughs> something. <clears throat> so we'll... Is, would, is everybody else gone? Well, I, yeah. Please. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so as, as Mr. Otto mentioned earlier, we were able to um, spend a couple of hours at Sato so I'd like to thank Ronnie Coleman and her staff and students for letting us visit. We, we started with a, um, a panel of, of students and they talked about how their involvement with Project Lead the Way um, a, a, a affects them and their, the courses they take, that type of thing. We were able to take a tour of the um, 
the Project Lead the Way classes, some of the classes, and we visited with teachers who are um, conducting uh, activities like the uh, an, avi an aviation club, uh, drone soccer, some other things, so it, very enlightening. And then, um, I forget what day, was that just Monday? It's been a long week already and it's Wednesday. Anyhow, so Monday, I believe it was, uh, Congressman Robert Garcia was visiting Lakewood High School, a US, uh, an AP US government class, and he, you know, basically had a, a, a private town hall meeting with this class. It was incredible. And it was very interesting. He talked about his humble beginnings. He talked about um, his uh, very new participation in, in Congress. And I think one of the most interesting things that he talked about was how a lot of members of Congress are wealthy, a lot of very wealthy people. And that's interesting because these are the people um, who are making decisions kind of for the rest of us average people or working class, that type of thing. And so I just thought that was a really interesting point um, and made me think about how, um, how, we, how we elect people, who we elect, and that whole process. So something to think about. Um, and then I'm glad you mentioned Chicago at Poly. I wasn't able to go to that one, but I was able to go to Millican for the Adams family. And it's always so impressive to see how talented our students are. This, this cast was amazing. Um, the, uh, this particular musical um, highlights talents for an ensemble cast. So a lot of the cast members had their time to shine. And we have students in the orchestra pit, students in the stage crew, all the staff, and I know how much extra time that people put into these productions with rehearsals and everything else. I know they, you know, they just put themselves into these things, and it just comes across so well, and it was very fun. Uh, and then I, I just want to thank our, our staff for putting in all the time and effort these past two days for these presentations. Um, and fielding our questions and uh, helping us understand, helping the community understand, giving us a big picture. And, and I, like, I like the point of how we started with our early learners and we kind of finished up yesterday with the College Promise. So it was kind of the big picture. Um, and it seemed like we talked about everything else in between. Uh, so thank you everybody. Uh, Mr. Otto? Can I turn it over to you now? Yes, okay. Thank you. As, as I think we all know, we um, just uh, were celebrating Black History Month. We had some phenomenal activities and, uh, uh, and I think that uh, uh, it was very, very uh, well received. Uh, we had a great program at, jo at Jordan High School that uh, you could just see by the looks on the people's faces, both in the audience and on stage, that uh, um, what we've committed to in terms of working with our uh, African-American uh, students and, uh, and um, uh, people in, in the district that uh, they were well on the way. but. Um, I, I have always felt that um, February is not enough, and not only is it not enough, but it's uh, it's it's a darn little bit. And uh, so, I uh, I've reached out to two people that I would like to recognize tonight um, uh, for their contributions to the city of Long Beach and what it is that they do. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep turning this off. Hey, Mac, your phone's, you just called me. <laughs> okay, so, um, so what, I, what I would like to do is, first of all, uh, ask uh, Matt Calvin to come forward. 
Mac, come on up to the to the microphone. Mac Calvin is a basketball legend in Long Beach who has now turned his attention to helping Long Beach youth achieve their potential. In his se senior year at Poly High School in 1965, he captained the basketball team and led them to an undefeated 34-0 and record while earning all CIF or Southern California honors. After a successful ca career at Long Beach City College, he matriculated to the University of Southern California, where he graduated in 1970 with, um, uh, and, uh, uh, with, a, with, a, with a degree and basketball honors. He was team captain and an all-conference uh, Pac-8 player his senior year, and uh, uh, it was a real accomplishment. Uh, I know many, many people that know Matt Calvin and the contributions that he's made to our city. Basketball was still in uh, Mac's future when he graduated from USC. He was drafted by the Los Angeles Lakers and also by the Los Angeles Stars and the American Basketball Association. He played professional basketball for 12 years. He was a five-time All-Star and a five-time All-Pro player. In his pro professional career, he scored over 13,000 points and ranks very high on the all-time professional basketball free throw list with an 88.9 accuracy rating. After his playing career ended, he coached basketball all over the United States for a variety of different teams uh, for 40 years. And after a stellar pro professional career, uh, Mac decided he wanted to devote most of his remaining time to helping Long Beach youth. He is a current member of the Long Beach City College Foundation Board of Governors and co-president of the Youth Empowerment Foundation, which he helped found and, and make successful. Over 15,000 boys and girls um, have participated in his three-day basketball uh, camps uh, throughout Southern California, and they're also uh, utilized by his friends who are um, uh, professional and collegiate basketball players and provide real inspiration to the students, the, the, the young men and women that participate. Funding for these activities has come from the Miller's Children's Foundation, uh, the Port of Long Beach, and many individual um, <clears throat> uh, don donors. Currently, Mac is focusing on students with the Math Collaborative at Jordan High School. He is an inspirational speaker and has spoken with, with the students at the Jordan Math uh, <clears throat> um, uh, Collaborative. Um, um, uh, on, on April 10 through 12, he is offering a free basketball uh, camp for, at the Long Beach Salvation Army. And with Doris Robinson at Jordan High School, uh, he is uh, planning a three-day basketball camp as part of Jordan's summer program at California State University at Long Beach. Uh, Mac was, was lionized or idolized by students because of his success both on the court and off the court. He deserves to be recognized uh, here in Long Beach where he grew up and for all the things that he's uh, accomplished and for what it is that he's trying to do to continue to give back to the, continue, uh, to the city of Long Beach and this area. So, Mac, congratulations. Um, we wanted to recognize you for all this. Thank you so much, Doc. I don't turn 75 until July. Doug, you keep going. I mean, we, I'll get there. But um, <clears throat> I am extremely honored and grateful to be standing in front of this uh, distinguished group of educators and really the pillars of this community from an educational posture. Um, 
to Dr. Baker and esteemed board, uh, Doug, uh, as well as my good friend Sharon there, longtime high school buddy. Um, it's just an honor to be here. And I want to acknowledge a couple of guests here. And, uh, when you said Cole, you're right, Cole. She is my Cole everything, my daughter, Christy Calvin. And, my, and Gail Calvin, my ex-wife. Um, Christy uh, helps me run my foundation. But um, as I said, I'm tremendously honored. <clears throat> um, I received a lot of awards in my life through my basketball achievements. But personally, there's no greater honor than to stand in front of you all tonight uh, because I'm one of the most luckiest guys in the world. I, um, <clears throat> Long Beach Unified School District has always played a significant role in my life. Education in my earlier years did not. And, um, and I don't generally get nervous, but uh, as I was walking, my daughter and I and Gail, we went to dinner earlier, and I was, as I was walking out, I saw a guy, he said, hi, Mac, and he looked like my old teacher. And I started running almost because <laughs> he's the only teacher that gave me a B, and I thought he was getting ready to take it back. You know? <laughs> but uh, all jokes aside, I'll make it sweet because I want you to honor Sharon. But I, I graduated from Long Beach Poly in 1965. I was reading at the seventh grade level. I had a 1.9 grade point average with over 100 scholarship offers and letters. So when it came time to graduating, um, it was Ms. Johnson in my arts and craft class that changed my grade from a D to a C in order for me to graduate. And it wasn't that I was dumb, it's just that I had some challenges. I stuttered and I didn't take the basic classes. I didn't know a period from a comma. That's why you all impressed me, because you're educators. And so uh, Ms. Johnson changed my grade from a D to a C in order for me to graduate to go to Long Beach City College. And, um, but what you remember as a child or as a young kid in high school is your teacher or your coach. But for me, it wasn't my coach who was Bill Mulligan, a renowned coach. Uh, my senior year, Bill Fo Willett Foster was my coach, but my principal, Neil Phillip, who later became the superintendent of school for the Long Beach Unified School District, was a tremendous influence on me. But the most important person at that school was a guy by the name of Frank Cook, who was the janitor, who saw that I was a kid that uh, come from a family of 10. My dad was an alcoholic, and so I had no place to study, and I was nervous all the time, and I stuttered. So I was, I was afraid to go to school as a kid made fun of me. But it was Frank Cook who basically gave me an opportunity to work in the cafeteria because if I didn't work, I didn't eat. That was my meal almost for the day. So, and then he also gave me my class ring. Uh, bought me my class ring, and he also bought me a letterman's jacket that put my letters on it. And so, real quickly, I matriculated over to Long Beach City College where I met three more individuals that basically changed my life and turned my life and made me who I am today, that gave me the educational foundation to really understand the purpose and meaning of an education. And that was my head coach, Chuck Kane, who did not look like me. And then all of you know Mr. Bill Barnes, who was an educator in, in this community for over 70 years. And then the other person is uh, Beverly O'Neill, who later became the mayor. She was my counselor. They really put me on a path to graduate, make the dean's list, and to go on and choose. Uh, had 50 scholarship offers. I chose UCLA, USC over UCLA, and I'm very proud of that. And so Smart today man. I Smart stand man. in front Dr. of you, is uh, a very proud person, because education is the most important thing to a young child. And so I will appeal to you that 
your teachers and your principals, I will share that never turn the light switch off on a young person, a young mind. And um, education is the key to economic wealth. It's the key to character, integrity. It is the key to relationships, no matter where community you live in or your zip code. And I'm proud of that because my daughter has gone before me. She's just recently got her master's two years ago in sports administration. And I'm very proud of her and I think she wants to go into education. She's got a few things that she's looking at, but I think that's her goal. But before I close, I want to say this. President John Kennedy said in 1961, the goal of education is the advancement of knowledge and the dissemination of truth. Children are the world's most valuable resource and its best hope for the future. And then he also went on to say, a child that is miseducated is a child that is lost. I represent to you tonight, you all, your hands, your minds, your decisions of who you hire and the policies you set will bring out the best or the worst in our young child. And so continue to do what you do. I applaud you from a distance. And I will be forever grateful for the education that I received at Long Beach Poly and the Long Beach Unified School District. Thank you, Doug, for recognizing me. Thank you, Dr. Jill, for your continued leadership and the board. I'm tremendously grateful and I'm blessed. And I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Calvin, we'd love for you to come up and receive your certificate and shake hands there, with there, our senior team and Mr. Otto. Oh, okay, okay. We'll shake our hands. Walk around and shake all of our hands. Thank you.
Miss Doris Robinson, will you stand? Yes, the legendary Miss Doris Robinson. I love who this lady is. She calls me sometime 11:30 at night, and that said she's busy. She she was on a Zoom with other teachers or, or other parents. So thank you, Miss Robinson. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mag. So, but, but we're not done. There's one other person we want to recognize, and it will become self-evident why we are doing so. Sharon Diggs Jackson is a true public servant for her native city of Long Beach, but still little is known of her role in civil rights in Long Beach uh, and, invo and involving the Long Beach Unified School District. After graduating from Wilson High School in 1974, and then the University of Southern California in 1978. She worked for IBM as an auditor for 13 years. In 1990, Sharon began her 20-year career with the city of Long Beach, first as an analyst in the Long Beach Police Department Narcotics and Crime Analysis Division, then in the city manager's office where she helped create and managed the Neighborhood Nuisance Abatement Program, and in 2000, the year 2000, she was promoted to the Long Beach Airport, where she served as the public information officer and manager of the no noise abatement pro office. In that job, she played an important role in the revitalization of the airport's flight, ser flight services and facilities, and she was responsible for overseeing the airport's community engagement plan. Get that, Mr. Benitez. <laughs> And help to do some Sharon. <laughs> and help to document the city's extensive uh, aviation history. She has always been interested in history. Following her retirement from the city of Long Beach in 2010, she and her husband, Dr. J. David Jackson, moved to Selma, Alabama, in search of their family's roots. While there, she and her husband modernized and reopened the Selma Walton Theater which had been closed for more than 10 years. And she also authored and published a book entitled Images of America, Selma, uh, which told the story in pictures and prose of the city of Selma, um, Al Selma, Alabama. Sharon and her husband returned to Long Beach in 2018 where their children and grandchildren live. Upon her return, she immediately resumed her history of public service. She became the executive director of the 501c3 nonprofit Elite Skills Development, which is dedicated to serving the underserved in Long Beach. Under her leadership, skills, uh, Elite Skills recently opened the Black Resources Center in Martin Luther King Park and launched the monthly Black Magic Gathering, which connects people in needs uh, uh, of existing programs here in Long Beach. With her background with the city, she was a natural. This work adds to her record of community service. She is also the co-founder with Errol Parker of the Education Council of the African American Parents. That program is now run by the Long Beach Unified School District and operates as the Senkofa, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Parent Village. She also served as a founding member of the Long Beach Center for Economic Inclusion, and that program was started by our now Mayor Rex Richardson when he was a council member for the 9th District. Um, she's also a founding um, board member of the African American Cultural Center here in Long Beach, in North Long Beach, a member of the Martin Luther King Park Visioning Committee and Place-Based Neighborhood Initiative. She has served for six years on the Long Beach City College Citizen Oversights Committee, which has monitored over $1 billion in bond proceeds. Recently, she served as vice chair of the Long Beach Independent Redistricting Commission, which thoughtfully and responsibly redrew local Long Beach boundaries. Sharon's history has also included civil rights activities right here in, in Long Beach, and I don't think very many people know this. In fifth grade, she, along with approximately 20 other 
um, uh, African American students became the first group to study at Minigant Elementary School in East Long Beach. And then in 1971, while attending Franklin Junior High School, she participated in the voluntary integration efforts at Wilson High School, from which she graduated in 1974. As a result of these and many, many more community activities, she was given the 2002 Martin Luther King Peacemaker Award. She has a reputation as the go-to person if you need to get something done in the city of Long Beach. And the Long Beach Unified School District is proud to recognize her career and all that she has accomplished. Sharon Diggs Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. I need to come out there. Here, here comes the mic. Whoop, whoop. Okay, that's good. Mac, you're making this hard now that I have to follow you in that eloquent remarks and quotes and all of that. Um, <laughs> that's true, you are. <laughs> uh, but Mac and I, actually our families grew up together. Our parents were great friends and so um, congratulations on being honored, congratulations. Um, but yes, thank you Doug also for this honor. It means a lot to me. Um, it's kind of funny when I worked for uh, the city of Long Beach because I spent so many, much time at district meetings and serving on committees, people just always assumed I worked for Long Beach Unified. And I've had people asking me that for 20 years, when did you graduate, from, I mean, uh, when did you retire from the district? And it's like, oh, I actually worked for the city. But it was a pleasure. Um, having grown up here, the foundation that I received here sort of set a path for my entire life. Um, the things that I couldn't get at home or that my parents couldn't provide for me usually were provided for me by Long Beach Unified. And so I am forever, forever grateful in that regard. Um, I'm grateful to my family who's here tonight, uh, my husband, my sister, um, my daughter, my niece, and my great niece. One of the interesting things about our family, we, I grew up three blocks from Polly. And so except for my husband, I have nine brothers and sisters. I have probably 200 relatives who live here. Um, I think until about the, what, the early 90s, I was probably the only one that didn't go to Poly. <laughs> out of all of that, and so that's still talked about. But the opportunity to actually be bused to Wilson to help integrate Wilson helped to set a path for me, my life as well. Uh, growing up in the central part, and Matt can attest to this, we didn't spend much time past Cherry. If you went past Redondo, you had to have a specific reason why you went, by, went that far east. And so to having been bused to Wilson, it opened up a whole nother world that I didn't really know existed in Long Beach. And so it has served me well. But I, again, I'm grateful, I know I made Another note here, I didn't know I was speaking, but again, after Mac, 
Let's see what else is there. Um, like, again, I mentioned that I've worked with many of you, uh, and I'm excited about that and look to continue to work with you. Uh, Juan and I serve on a board together. Uh, Eric, I've known him since he was a baby. Um, Doug and I at one time or another served on a, on a board together. So that's the, what's good about Long Beach, is how our circles evolve, how we work together, and we know that there are still challenges ahead of us, and it's gonna take all of that connectedness, that full circle for us to address some of the problems that you talked about, Juan, uh, you know, bringing some of those to resolution. The circle is really important. So thank you for honoring me and acknowledging uh, just my years of service. And uh, I'm here to continue to work with you however I can. Dr. Baker, too, it's always good to see you. Please. Well, thank you for being here um, <clears throat> and, and sharing your stories and uh, allowing us to acknowledge the good work that's being done and, and remind us the, the decisions we make today go forward for generations. Um, and so now that brings us to our superintendent's report. I think that's the perfect place to stop. <laughs> thank you. I have no report tonight. Okay, in which case, unless there's an objection, I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for the last two days. Um, our next regularly scheduled meeting is Monday, so Monday, April 17th.